Welcome back. Well, this is the third food summit. The first one was held in Rome in November 1996 with representatives from 185 nations. They aimed to cut the number of hungry people in half by 2015. Their plan of action included eradicating food insecurity and malnutrition. The summit had mainly managed to raise awareness among the participants and set a blueprint for an ongoing effort. The second summit was in 2002. 180 nations met again to examine whether hunger still persisted despite the 1996 plan of action. Progress had lagged by at least 60% behind the goals for the first five years. They concluded that hunger is actually on the rise and stated a lack of will, not only because most of the Western leaders didn't even show up themselves, but took part in the NATO meeting one week later. So what makes this summit any different? Well, here's how the head of the Food and Agriculture Organization, Jacques Duf, explained it. I hope that for the first time, countries have seen enough signs of possibilities of more and more crises with political consequences, with uh, uh, riots and so on, and with deaths. These they have seen. Before we were uh, calling on humanitarian ground for their, uh, the support of those who had the resources. Before we were calling on equity ground that uh, there should be more resources to poor countries. We were even drawing the attention on the risk of migration from poor countries to rich uh, countries. But this time, the situation is political. It's even what I would call a matter of peace and security of the world. We're still joined by our guests in Rome, Alexander Saris, Director of Trade and Market for the Food and Agriculture Organization. Also in Rome, Sylvia Boren, Co-Chair of Global Call to Action Against Poverty. And in Delhi, Vandana Shiva, an ecologist, farmer and author. Miss Shiva, there have been two conferences before this one. They were unsuccessful. Does that make it easy for you to understand why many would call this just a talking shop? Well, the problem is it's not just a talking shop. In fact, the food riots and food wars aren't just taking place on the streets of Egypt and in Mexico. They're taking place right there in the corridors of FAO. On the one hand, there's the world's movements, the concerned communities asking for ways in which we will address the food scarcity by growing more food sustainably with less fossil fuel inputs and more fair systems of distribution and trade, which means reworking the rules of the agreement on agriculture. On the other hand, the very people who have shaped industrial chemical agriculture and created food scarcity in local economies, and the very people who shaped the agreement on agriculture of WTO are standing there to say, let there be more investment, but let it be turned into a subsidy for us. So we spread a second green revolution in Africa. So we get the subsidies for GM seeds and hybrid seeds and for chemical fertilizers. And we get new subsidies for supplying the poor of the world with food. What we need is making local economies robust. The food war in the corridors must now become open and we must recognize the greed of agribusiness, the monopolies of agribusiness as the real reason people starve in the world, farmers commit suicide and women and children go hungry. People are capable of producing food. Let the governments and international trade rules stop the obstruction and let the unfair subsidies going to agribusiness stop the unfair markets. Let's, let's go to Alexander prices. Saris. Sorry to interrupt you. Let's go to Al Alexander Saris. On Tuesday, Abdullah Wad, Senegal's president, accused FAO of treating developing countries like, quote, beggars. Your response to that? <laughs> well, <laughs> let me sort of respond to uh, what I heard uh, before. Now, the the position of FAO, and has been expressed by our Director General several times, is that the major solution to the problem of the high food prices and the soaring food prices is definitely to increase world food production, and certainly where it can be done best. And uh, there, the possibilities 
are best in developing countries because the developed countries have already achieved very, very high productivity levels, while the developing countries are lagging very much behind. And the technology is already there for them to increase production and uh, achieve uh, uh, better levels of self-sufficiency. Let me add one point. A lot of people blame the international system, and there is a lot to be blamed there, but the largest markets for food products are going to be the developing countries themselves. So the domestic markets in many developing countries and the regional markets offer tremendous possibilities for the output of increased production when that is forthcoming. And that can be managed by regional agreements and uh, various other trade agreements among the developing countries themselves in addition to the WTO. So there's a lot that can be done at the individual and regional country oh, okay, level. Okay, sorry, and I'm sorry to interrupt you once again. Time is racing by. I see Sylvia Boren shaking her head furiously. Ma'am, you have less than a minute left on this program. Go ahead. Well, it's important that we don't imitate um, the oil-intensive food production of the Western countries. It's important that we go to the sustainable production that Vandana is talking about. It's important that we make sure that women who now get only 5% of the support in agricultural work, while they are growing most of the food in the developing countries, that they are part of who is doing the agricultural planning. It's important that we stop imposing a model that is not working for the people and that is causing this hunger and that we begin to plan in the countries locally. All the right. security Ms. Boren, of you made your point. Like I'm sorry to interrupt like you. I hate to interrupt you, but I have to. Sylvia Boren, Alexander Saris and Vandana Shiva, thank you very much for joining us here on Inside Story. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye for now.